Kia ora koutou, a karakia te mata. Ko te kupu, te kupu, ko te atua, te atua. Ko rangi nui ki runga, ko papa atua nuku ki raro. Ka mate ai te tangata, ka pō, ka ao, ka awatea. Ka tikara, ka hoki te mihi, ki tō tātou kai hanga ora, te nā koe. I ngā tira wairua, haere, haere, haere atu rā. Huri noa ki a tātou, te kā nuhi ora, tihei mauri ora. Mauri ora. E ho mā. Kia tū pato e te āhuatanga o te wā, e ai ki ngā kōrero, e noho ki te kainga, kia haumaru te noho, mā reira tātou e ora ai. Ko te tūmanako e haumaru ana koutou, me tō whānau katoa, ngā mihi nui ki a tātou katoa. Kua tai mai nei, mō te kaupapa, ki te whakawhiti-whiti kōrero, ki tātou manuhiri ko Pania Newton. Nō reira, nau mai, hara mai, whakatau mai. A tēnā tātou, ko wai tēnei, he rimokupona tēnei, nō te whānau apa nui, a ngā tipurau Waikato Tainui hoki, e tū whakaiti tēnei i a koutou, ko Tia Carlson a hau, e mihi ana. Kia ora e te whānau, welcome to the final webinar for Te Tiriti Based Futures and Anti-Racism 2020. Here's a slide with the presentation title, The Struggle for Ihu Matau. In case you're in the wrong place, but of course you are in the right one. Our kai kōrero today, as I said, is Pānea Newton, and I'm your ringa hāpai, ko tia Carlson ahau. And this uh, webinar format is fireside chat. So uh, sit back, relax, hope you've got your uh, drinks, um, you've got a comfortable spot, and you've got a great and amazing view in front of you. And Tato, uh, you can interact and ask questions uh, during the Zoom features. So here's a slide with the basic features. And there's also a moderator on, on hand to help me facilitate discussion. And feel free to use this to share your thoughts, share links, and I will do my best to convey those. So um, this is a native virtual rako kia koe e pānia. Kia ora. O tēnā koe e hoa. Ngā mihi nui ki a koe mo tērā mihi mahana. Me o kōrero taunaki hoki, mō tēnei kaupapa tino whakahirahira, anō nei tēnei kaupapa a tino rangatira no reira. Ka mihi ki a koe. Ka mihi hoki ki a koutou e mātakitake mai ana. Ngā e kōre koutou he kano hikitea, engari kai te rongo tō koutou wairua, e kōrero. E hara mai ana ki runga i tēnei mea, mā runga i te ukurangi nei, nō reira tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora everybody, as Tia mentioned, I'm your kai kōrero for today, unfortunately or fortunately. But no, it's an honour and a privilege to be able to support this kaupapa, a very important one, considering the... The context in which we are we are operating or, or living in at the at this time, um, and yeah, it's an honour to be able to come on here and, and share with you an update about our Kopapa and to talk to you too about uh, the history of this um, Kopapa uh, regarding uh, Tehu or Mataoho or otherwise famously known as Ihu Mata. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. I whakapapa on my father's side to Waikato, Ngāti Mahuta, Te Ahiwaru, Waikato Whānui me ki Ngāti Maniapoto. And on my mother's side, I whakapapa to Te Raroa Ngāpuhi. So yeah, really, I'm one of five siblings to my parents. I'm the second to youngest child. I grew up in, in Kohanga Reo, Kura Kaupapa and Whare Kura, and eventually I went off to um, the University of Auckland where I studied a conjoint degree in law and health sciences. Uh, 
one of my passions, uh, obviously, uh, the stake here at Ihumato. Uh, I enjoy spending time with my whānau. Uh, um, and I enjoy uh, being out in my māra and doing all things Māori. And uh, when I have the time, I, I love to do a bit of travel, especially here in Aotearoa, because it's such a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. uh, so my kōrero uh, today will be uh, mostly in regard to uh, my experience here at Ihumato, the historical, uh, I'll touch on the historical context of this kaupapa, as well as the political uh, context of our kaupapa, and also give you a bit of an update of where things are at uh, in regards to uh, this tuki. Uh, so, uh, I would probably begin my kōrero with uh, how uh, we got to, to this point, uh, where we are currently occupying the whenua at Ihumato. And some of you are watching uh, have come out to Ihumato, mm -hmm. uh, have been part of this kaupapa for the last uh, five minutes or five years, <laughs> uh, and um, some of you may have not have been out to Ihumato. Um, but I just wanted to firstly acknowledge those of you who have uh, and um, say thank you for supporting our kaupapa uh, in, in, in any way that you have and to also encourage those who haven't come to the whenua or heard about our kaupapa to get online. Um, there's so much information about, out there about uh, what we're doing and what we've, um, what's gone on over the past five years and also um, to come out here when, um, when the lockdown is finished or when it finishes um, and come and enjoy this very beautiful um, whenua of ours. Um, so I want to start in uh, 1863, um, where we could say uh, the beginning of, uh, you know, the breaches, the, the beginning of the direct impacts that the breaches to Te Tiriti or Waitangi had are now Fano here at Ihumatong. And it begins in 1863 when uh, Sir Governor Gray issued a proclamation uh, to our Fano and to those residing in Ihumato and near Ihumato, requiring them to take the oath of allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen. Those who took the oath of allegiance were uh, offered protection and those who did not uh, want to take the oath of allegiance were required to uh, leave Ihumato and uh, were ejected beyond the Mangatawhiri River where the Kingitanga was strongest. They sent us to, uh, you know, to Mangatawhiri to where the Kingitanga was strongest because uh, we had a strong affiliation to the Kingitanga movement. And that was because in 1858, Potototi Whero Whero, the first Māori king, was residing in Ihumato when he took up the mantle to become the first Māori king. And what we know about the Kingitanga movement is that it was formed in response to the mass land alienations that were happening as a result of, of the breaches to Te Tiriti o Waitangi and were happening uh, around that time. So they formed the Kingitanga movement to unite Māori against um, mass land confiscations. Uh, and so for the majority of our people in Ihumato, because we were staunch to the Kingitanga movement, our whānau uh, left. Those who took the oath of allegiance and remained in Ihumato and were uh, you know, promised protection, uh, that history tells us that wasn't the case. Uh, many of those who remained or took the oath weren't given protection and were forced to become workers for the settlers' families who acquired the land after it was confiscated. And when their whare were burnt, um, their, their you know, possessions were um, confiscated and um, so on. But because those of our whānau who remained here as workers for the settler whānau, we were able to claim we're able to claim today um, continuous occupation at Ihumato. And the people at Ihumato and this papakainga is one of the oldest across the motu. It's over a thousand years old. Um, and since the arrival of our people and through the ejection 
1863, we have remained as ahika. So when we uh, retreated, when most of our whānau retreated to uh, Mangatakere, uh, and they crossed the river, they were met by a militia that was led by Sir Mamaduke Nixon. Uh, and um, he, you know, ordered uh, the militia to open fire on many of those who crossed the Awa, and for, uh, you know, many of those um, people had perished. And um, what Pākehā his historians, Pākehā historians actually describe that incident as what the, the initiating point to what they describe as the uh, greatest war for New Zealand, and that was the Waikato Wars. They saw more deaths in that war um, than World War I. After that war, our people started to return back, uh, and uh, they weren't you know, given their whenua back, what they were given was 0 0.067 hectares of land in which our marae, um, Makoto marae, is currently, um, where it is currently situated. Uh, over, t over the years, our whānau uh, brought back w what land they could, uh, and um, of the 1,100 acres that was confiscated, I think we, as a whānau, um, as a hapu, own uh, or are in possession of less than uh, 50 acres of that whenua. Uh, over the years, um, we continue to suffer ongoing injustices as a result of, you know, breaches to Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And um, some of those were, you know, largely seen between the 1950s and the early 2000s. And so some of those um, examples of breaches included um, in the 1950s, particularly, and um, was the quarrying of our maunga. So Ihumato was uh, the tuturu name, the original name of Ihumato is Te Ihu o Matoho, and translated to English, that means uh, the nose piece of Matoho, who we believe is the god of the volcanoes in Tamaki Makoto. So there are four maunga. There were four Maunga in, in Ihumato, but three of the four were quarried away. They were, we were told that it was a sacrifice that we had to make. Uh, we accepted, we adapted, and we moved on. But for many of us, Māori and Pacifica, who are watching, we know the significance of our tūpuna Maunga um, to our identity and to our um, sustenance and survival as a, as a peoples. And so that was a huge impact um, that had a huge impact on our people. And from then, uh, we would say that that's when our people started to feel a large sense of hopelessness within our papakainga. And it was, uh, you know, perpetuated through the, uh, you know, more modern um, treaty breaches that I'll, I'll quickly, briefly touch on. Um, so. Yes, we had the, the 1950s, the quarrying of our maunga, and then in the 1960s, we had the establishment of the Māori Wastewater Treatment Plant. And what that saw was the establishment of oxidation ponds uh, right on the fringe of our papakainga, and it filled 500 hectares of intercoastal foreshore with um, Auckland's waste. Um, so what they did was they moved, um, you know, the the treatment plant from uh, Orake, and they moved it over here to Ihumato. And essentially they moved one issue from one Māori community and moved it to another. And what that oxidation pond, or ponds, um, the establishment of that saw was the pollution of the Manukau Harbour. And, uh, you know, that, that after our gardens were destroyed in 1863 and our whenua was confiscated, the moana became a place that we heavily relied on uh, for survival and sustenance. And so that was, that was lost. And so many of our people turned to Western means of um, survival that weren't necessarily aligned with our uh, ways of living uh, um, and particularly wasn't in line with, um, you know, our tikanga and our kawa that was large, you know, that was practiced here in our papakainga. Uh, and um, what we saw through the establishment of the mainly wastewater treatment plant too was uh, the uh, two 
uh, environmental champions um, who stood up and fought against um, the pollution of the Manukau Harbour, namely, um, you know, our kahurangi Nikoman Hanuk, um, who led the Y008 claim, which was the first ever Treaty of Waitangi claim heard in its history. Mm -hmm. And it was heard here in Ihumato at our marae. Um, in the early 2000s, those were disestablished as a result of that treaty claim, and we were really happy about that. Mm. Uh, being, I just want to quickly mention here um, that, you know, being on the fringes of that wastewater treatment plant and being with the community who suffered the most, um, you know, uh, you know, we were told that we had to sacrifice our moana, you know, for the, for the greater good of Auckland. Um, we, you would have thought that we would have been one of the first communities um, hooked up to an adequate sewage system, mm. um, but that wasn't the case for us here in Ihumato. In fact, we were the last community, one of the last communities in Auckland to be hooked up to an adequate sewage system. Many of our uh, houses, our whare out here, um, are still on septic tanks. Uh, what they did was they started at the first Pākehā farmer's house, they skipped the papakāinga and then they started again at the next Pākehā farmer's house. So it was a huge injustice for us. Um, then if that wasn't enough, uh, the same happened with the power. Uh, you know, Ihumato was, was skipped out and left out again. And it's strange when you come out here and you still see um, our papakāinga, um, you know, on those, those power lines above the ground. Um, because mm. in, mostly in Auckland now, they're all underground. But, mm. you know, yeah, again, it just speaks to the disregard that um, the government and council have for our papakainga here. And so that was um, the 1960s. In the early 2000s, I'll quickly um, rush through this. Um, in 2009, when the o Auckland International Airport was looking to establish their second runway, they... Um, we're applying for resource consent and our Fano and our Pakeke uh, partook in that resource consent hearing. And what they told the airport and the commissioners um, at, on the panel, uh, they told them that there was a 600 year old Urupa in this, the path of the second airport runway. They ignored our Pakeke's pleas because they said there wasn't any Pakeha evidence to support their claims. Uh, they were granted resource consent and they progressed with their development. And during it, um, we saw eight, 87 human remains, 87 of our tubunas koiri was dug up and placed in a container for two years and um, returned to us in sacks and we were told to bury them somewhere else. Uh, if that wasn't enough, in 2013, um, our awa orurangi uh, was polluted with a thousand litres of industrial dye spill um, and at, in that year, what we saw was a lot of um, industrial factories that were being proposed for this area were applying for stormwater discharge consent. And uh, when we saw that devastation with the dye spill, uh, many of us in the Papakainga suspected that it was used um, to test the tidal flow of the incoming tide um, for their resource consents. In that year, Auckland Council actually described that incident as the most devastating Auckland um, accidental dye spill in all of its history. Um, so that was another sacrifice we had to make for the greater good of Auckland. Um, and that brings us to um, the, the most recent um, injustice here at Ihumato in regards to um, the Wallace block or the Puketapapa block that we are currently um, occupying. And that came about in 2014 when uh, Fletcher, uh, when the Wallace family were applying for um, their, their land block that was granted to them through uh, after it was confiscated. They were um, applying for, to have this land block established as a special housing area. Um, prior to that, in 2007, our Pakeke and our Papakainga were told that this particular land block was supposed to become part of the Otuatoa Stonefields Historic Reserve, which sits um, right next door, uh, which is adjacent to uh, the Puketapapa block, which is in contention. Um, for many years, we were excited about that. We were really happy. 
Um, Helen Clark came out, she opened up the stone fields, um, the reserve, and then being told that this block was going to be added on um, was a huge, uh, you know, it was a boost for us. It was, it was a victory because, um, you know, Ihu Mato has experienced so many injustices. Um, but when one day, sadly, in 2015, we were taking a hikoi across our whenua and um, we noticed survey pegs on the Wallace block. And um, we went home and we investigated and we found that there was a $500 multi-million dollar housing complex proposed by Fletcher Building Limited for this whenua. And that was the first that, um, you know, we had heard about it. And um, it was devastating to, to um, hear that this whenua that was going to become public open space, that was going to be green space, um, shared with all of Aotearoa and going to be added onto the Stonefields and Stock Reserve was, um, you know, designated a special housing area where 500 million dollar houses were um, being proposed to be built. Um, as you can, um, well, but having, we were really lucky when we, when we, at the time that we found out, we put out a pānui on our Alfano Facebook page and we asked those of Alfano who were interested in um, learning more about this kaupapa and, um, you know, who, who knew about anything to come along to this hui. Uh, we went along to the hui and at that hui, six rangatahi from our papakainga and from our marae um, turned up at my cousin's house. And um, at that hui, over dinner, we had decided that um, we would do everything in our power to oppose the development. Those six cousins who turned up uh, were lucky enough to have finished high school and um, we were lucky enough to be able to go to university and learn about, um, you know, Māori political movements across Aotearoa that inspired us, such as Parihaka, Pākai Tore, uh, um, Takaparafa, Bastion Point, uh, Te Kōpua, Whena Kupa, and the Māori Land March, and so on. And so, um, and we had all studied different things as well. My background was in law. Uh, that was the same year that I graduated. Um, my cousin had two years before that graduated from law. Uh, my cousins were teachers, they're photographers, they're business owners, um, and so on. And that's only a small percentage of our whanau, um, and those of us who reside in the Papakainga, you know, had that opportunity to go to university. And so having the knowledge that we learned at uni and being young um, and energised and motivated, we decided that we would start a group to stop the development. And that group started in 2015, and we sought the blessing of our pakeke and our kaumatua and our marae. And ever since, we've been operating within that mandate. Um, in 2015, we also established a group known as the Save Our Unique Landscape Group, SOL. And we are made up of um, tangata whenua, mana whenua, um, our pakeha whanau, uh, you know, many people from different professions. Uh, and uh, that's, yeah, that, that formed our group. And uh, we've been going ever since. And one thing I want to say about the Soul Campaign, um, they are resilient. Um, we've been lucky enough to have a lot of pakeke in that rōpū um, who have the resource and, and who have retired, so they have the time uh, to support kaupapa like these. And I always say... Uh, and I'm proud to say that the Soul Campaign and the Soul Fano is a great example of what biculturalism should look, um, how it should look in Aotearoa, because we were led by um, rangatahi and kuia from our papakainga and our marae, uh, and we were supported largely by our Pākehā 
allies or our Pākehā whānau. And sadly, many um, of those within our rōpū were um, Pākehā, and we were largely uh, criticised because of that. But, um, you know, they came with their, their time, their aroha, their wanting to tautoko a, a kaupapa like this, and with their knowledge and experience, which has been so invaluable in, in this kaupapa. Uh, because of the tenacity and the resilience of the Soul Campaign, we've been lucky enough to exhaust um, a lot of uh, avenues available to us um, to fight uh, this sort of kaupapa. And those include going to the UN three times in New York and Geneva, where we presented before um, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and the Indigenous Forum, or the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and um, an, another forum on economic and... Um, oh, the name has, has gone beyond me at this time, uh, but... Yeah, it was another forum in Geneva as well, uh, which was a great experience. A lot of people criticise those platforms, uh, you know, for many reasons. The UN is uh, a little bit outdated um, and it's, it's an overseas um, organisation uh, and it comes with many of its faults, but it also comes with a lot of benefits as well, such as, um, you know, it, it, it's quite appealing um, to the general public to know that you've gone over to overseas to take this taki. Um, and it was a benefit for us to um, continue the legacies that our tupuna left for us, um, such as, you know, Papa Joe Hawke and Ngani Komen Hinnik and Tupu Kaha who walked this hikoi and took, um, you know, similar taki over to um, the United Nations many years ago. And, you know, I, I think back to Tupu Tangakaha, who went with Tahu Portiki to the League of Nations in Geneva in 1924. And their take was uh, mass land confiscations. And to think that we took these kopapa, the same kopapa in 2017 and 2018 is, um, you know, is quite... Um, you know, amazing to think. Mm. No, I, I don't even think amazing is the word. It's like uh, shocking that, you know, in this day and age, we're still having to do the same thing that our tupuna did many, many years ago. Um, other things that we've done is um, gone to the Environment Court, uh, the Tenancy Tribunal Court, the High Court. Um, we've taken petitions to Parliament, made submissions to, to Council, done many, many hikoi. Uh, one of the things that we did over the year was, um, over the years, was one day every week for three years, we stood outside Fletcher Building Limited headquarters in Penrose, uh, waving our flags, um, giving them pe our oh. peace of mind on, on those loud hailers yeah. um, and, you know, hang, hanging out. And it was kind of like a space for us to be able to vent, um, mm -hmm. which was quite interesting. Um, yeah. And we've done many other things. And one of those um, that I want to highlight is actually occupying the whenua. And we did that in 2016. We did it on the 4th of November, um, the day before the Parihaka commemoration. And we did that in honour of the Parihaka movement. And we did it too because many of our philosophies and our tikanga pertaining to our campaign um, derive from the Parihaka movement. And... That was because we saw that movement as a source of inspiration and motivation. Um, yeah. And we've been here on the Fenua ever since. Um, and last year, on the 23rd of July, uh, we were evicted from our Fenua. 120 police officers, uh, Fletcher Building staff and employees and contractors um, came to Humato and evicted me and my whanau uh, from our whenua. Uh, we put a call out uh, to, our, to the nation and we were very, very lucky enough to have thousands and thousands of people arrive in that first week. I think the weekend after we put the call out, um, the Māori wardens had recorded 
on that Saturday alone, 11,000 people had passed through our whenua. And as a result of the mass support um, that we received, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, decided to put a halt on the future development. And she made a promise um, or commitment to find a resolution for Ihumato that we could all live with. And ever since, we've been working towards that resolution. Uh, this has been a huge, since the eviction, it's been a huge operation. I think the police costs um, exceed over $2 million. Uh, you would have thought that um, we would have learned something from uh, mm. the Takaparafa um, eviction. But uh, when I think back to that cold morning on the 23rd of July and the days and months following, um, you know, it almost, you know, you could see the similarities between what happened at Bastion Point and what um, happened here at Ihumato. Um, over time, because over the months, because the, the Prime Minister had put a halt to the development, the police presence and the security presence had lessened. Um, and over time, Alfano uh, left because we asked him to go home, recharge, re-energize. Um, if should we need to call them back, if you know the police presence increased increased again. Um, luckily, we haven't had to. Uh, all the police uh, equipment, uh, I'm sorry, Fletcher equipment have left, and we uh, we. Uh, are happy to say that we are close to a resolution um, and, it, and um, yeah, we, we, we are happy where the conversations are at and um, have faith that the Kingitanga are there um, representing us. Um, we can expect an announcement soon, but I feel like mm -hmm. I'm always saying that um, it's because when we come close to making the announcement, something significant happens. And that's, yeah. you know, with what has happened with the Fakari um, incident, when, um, you know, the, the eruption that happened at White Island. Uh, we also had <laughs> other issues that arose. And, of course, what is happening now um, with the, the epidemic. But we are patient, Fano. Um, when I think of our struggle for Ihumato, um, mine and my cousins and, and that of souls, that's only been five minutes in the history of, um, of injustices that Māori have had to face over the last 170 years. Uh, and so we are being patient um, with the announcement and um, our priority at this time is just making sure that uh, the well-being and health of our nation is... Um, the focus. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where things are at at the moment. We are still here on the whenua mm -hmm. and um, we are living on the whenua as though the resolution has already been met. So we're growing our gardens, we're doing mahinga kai, uh, we're practicing our tikanga and our kawa uh, and working to revive some of those as well that were lost through the confiscation. Um, uh, what else are we doing? I just say that we're just here living our best lives, mm. uh, you know, living out the, the dreams, the hopes and the aspirations that our Pakeke had for, for us and, and for this whenua. When people ask me what has been the most challenging thing in this kaupapa, it wasn't fighting a transnational, a multi-billion dollar, million dollar, whatever you want to say, corporation. It was um, hearing the stories of our Pakeke about what, Ihumato was once like you know they would talk about their they would share their stories about when they would go down to the moana and collect kai and when they would swim down there in crystal blue and green water when they would um you know catch the native eel that that roamed um orua rangiawa and when they would ride their horses out to the airport and watch the planes take off um you know Sadly, those are luxuries that I've never enjoyed in my whole lifetime. Uh, since I was born, our moana has always been polluted. Our maunga were quarried away. Um, our whenua was confiscated. And we've had to live within the confines of, of small papakainga. And when people come here and say, oh, you know, Pania's, you know, this is only, you know, you should give it up. Um, 
you know, this is, a, you know, there's other fish to fry or there's other whenua elsewhere. And I'm like, well, that's easy for you to say, um, you know, and I, I speak to, <laughs> you know, our, our MP Penny Hena there who, who come and said, you know, it's, it's a fate of complete. There's nothing to be done. But I said, you know, Penny, that's all right for you to say because you can go back to Te Raroa where there's hundreds and thousands of Māori, um, you know, Te, te Raroa land. Um, for us here in Ihu Mātau, for Te Ahiwaru and for Makaurau Marae, this is the last piece of whenua that we have left. Mm -hmm. And without whenua, who are we as a people? Um, mm -hmm. You know, whenua is where we source our identity from and where we get our sustenance, um, energy and motivation from. And without it, um, there's nothing. And so that's why we continue in this kaupapa. And despite people saying that we're young, we're dumb, we're naive, we're inexperienced, and because we're wahine, we can't do this kaupapa. Uh, but that fuels our fire. And um, mm -hmm. despite all those hare hare kōrero, those criticisms, um, we continued because uh, we only ever wanted to be the best kaitiaki that we could be. We only wanted to protect um, the whenua and everything that it stood for. Um, and, you know, in this kaupapa now, um, through all the sacrifices, um, it's all been worth it because um, this kaupapa will contribute to a better Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. And we hope to leave a legacy for our tamariki and our mokopuna and our nieces and nephews to follow and years to come. Um, so on that note, I might end my kōrero there and take any questions that um, Tia or those who are watching might have. Sorry, I went on for longer than I thought I would. Um, oh, but, kia ora. Yeah. Kia ora, Pania. Um, you're getting um, lots of messages coming in, um, messages that say it brings tears to my eyes, uh, such a strong storyteller, kia kaha, Pania. Um, so that's beautiful to see in the chat, um, lots of messages of support. I have to say, when you started your kōrero, and I've um, heard it before, that still that... Um, embodied sense of historical trauma that we kind of go through and journey through as you um, talk about the the history of Ihu Matau and I didn't actually prepare bringing tissues so you would have seen me wife wiping my hupe all over my head <laughs> um, but I think that's an important part of being able to to listen and engage with it is to share that sense of vulnerability, share that emotion and, and not hide that. And um, I very much embody that as you, as you took us through that, that beautiful history into that, to this present day. Um, I do have a, a, a couple of parts I, that I just wanted to start on, if that's okay. And then we'll get on to the, the Q and A. Um, I understand that the reclamation of Ihu Matau has remained outside of the treaty claim approach. And I was really interested in, um, to see that it's rather taken indigenous rights approach. Uh, why has this stand been so important for you in the Soul campaign? When we, um, one of our strategies in this kaupapa um, was this having this notion of death by a thousand cuts. And so uh, mm. we tried to exhaust every legal means available to us um, in order to protect mm. our whenua and, um, you know, employ any, um, you know, any strategy which would help us um, to do that. Um, you know, we, we, we lodged a, um, a, and a Treaty of Waitangi claim under urgency um, in regards to the... Um, the process in which Special Housing Area 62, uh, which is the housing development that was um, approved for Ihu Mato, um, how that came um, to be uh, legislat legislatively. And so um, we, we did take um, the treaty route, but we knew that that couldn't be, that we would be naive, I think, um, is the best thing for oh well, how I would describe it and um, to only focus on that route and so um, we um, took a we, we used a lot of strategies and we knew we needed to appeal to the masses and um, you know 
middle New Zealand, uh, you know, the general New Zealand public see the Treaty of Waitangi route um, as um, being exclusively for Māori. And so that's why we also went down the heritage route and why we went down the, the um, United Nations route, um, why we, we um, you know, used, employed different um, strategies in this kaupapa to protect our whenua. Um, and be, we knew too that in kaupapa like this, uh, you know, it was a numbers game. Mm. Um, we needed to appeal to as many people as we could. And so we used every, um, not tactic, but every strategy mm. um, that we could to draw people into this kaupapa. And the beautiful thing about uh, whenua is that is, it is inclusive. And so um, we were able to use different um, strategies that re that could relate or that was you know, useful in protecting our whenua or could potentially um, was going to be um, in order uh, to resonate with different groups of people. I don't know if I'm making sense. <laughs> no, you are, um, you are. But yeah, we, we identified early on that whenua was inclusive mm. and we needed to appeal to a lot of people and going down one route, um, you, you know, was strategically yeah. not the best thing for us to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we used every other route yeah. um, because we wanted to make sure that we had avenues available to us and because too we knew that um, it would appeal to, to other people. Mm -hmm. With this kaupapa, it's not just about whenua, um, mm -hmm. but it's about, you know, standing up for human rights, mm -hmm. upholding Indigenous rights. It's about feminism too because it is the wahine who are leading this kaupapa and it was the kuia and, and the nannies and the aunties who um, guided us to, in this kaupapa. Uh, this is about preventing environmental degradation as well. Um, and so knowing all those things and, and um, whenua being related to all those things helped us in resonating with so many different people and so many different organisations that supported us over the years. Mm -hmm. Order. And that seems like such a like death by a thousand cuts. That's it's not, not behind the scenes. You didn't have like this huge amount of labor force behind you to enable you to do all that different kaupapa. And I, I can only imagine what that's like putting your energy into so many different spaces and, and how you really take care of that, that energy source and, and how, how you re-energize that your modi um, as as um, as soul campaign and and yourself, how, how does that happen? If you could, um, yeah, explain yeah. that a bit. So, um, having gone to university and learnt um, the Western systems yeah. of law, mm. um, and to learn to about how. Um, you know, what our constitutional framework looked like and how it operated here in Aotearoa. And also having grown up in this heavily te ao Māori um, worldview, I, um, I am able and was able to walk comfortably in mm. two worlds. Mm. And so having to, to chop and change between the different avenues which could solely be focused on uh, you know, the Western law um, could, you know, when we were operating within the Māori land court, we were incorporating um, tikanga Māori um, and L-O-R-E. And then mm -hmm. when we're on the whenua, we're operating as if we're in a marae. And then when we're in the court, you know, we're operating within mm -hmm. this Pākehā framework. So I was really lucky to be able to comfortably walk in those two worlds, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. gone to university and growing up the way that I had. Mm -hmm. um, also, my, um, ex my, my background and uh, the way that I was raised and, and the environment that I was raised in um, meant, uh, gave me the, the lived experience to be able to um, relate to a lot of people as well. Um, and um, having those Pakeke experts our Pakeke whānau, I call them my aunties, 
mm-hmm. um, and uncles, our Pākehā Pākeke and our Soul Campaign, who guided us in those Pākehā systems as well, uh, were very, very um, helpful. Mm. Um, so having those, um, mm. that, that, those supports and knowledge um, gave me the resilience, mm. I suppose, or experience to be able to or navigate within those, the, the different worlds that this campaign has had to operate in. Um, but as well to we draw our, um, our energy and our motivation from previous Maori political movements that mm. have inspired us. Um, we draw our energy from the whenua and we mm. draw it from the people around us who continue to motivate us um, and support our kaupapa near and far. I remember, you know, I had shitty ass days where people were like, you know, you read those stupid comments on Facebook and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. she should go home and feed her 10 children. And I'm like, I don't even have any children. <laughs> or people are like, oh, you know, that that girl occupying the whenua, she's a dull bludger, beneficiary, she should get a job. And I'm like, I've got two jobs, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, even on, <laughs> and you, you know, you feel bad about that and you get really frustrated. But, you know, the whenua grounds you. And those around you ground you and support you and lift you back up. So it's always important in capable like these to have a good team yeah, um, yeah. around you. Um, so yeah. Right. And it and it yeah, when I've the times that I've gone there, I really felt like I arrived at um, a space of Wahitapu and going into the village and um, it, especially when the uh, occupation was on, there was an amazing, um, that I have never experienced in my life, my lifetime, apart from when I'm down the coast, um, like in Uawa and the boondocks at the back blocks, where there's this real village mentality and this beautiful sense of ahua and generosity. You know, people are in their tents and leaving stuff out and, it was just such an amazing experience to take our tamariki to and, and it was such an honour and they just, you know, ran freely and ran around and really enjoyed that space. Um, so in, in the past, you've described it as um, a place of wahitapu and what has that meant for the campaign and, and how you con- conducted it? Um, first and foremost, we got involved in this kaupapa um, one, because we were raised knowing that we were kaitiaki for our whenua and our whanau and our rights. And secondly, because um, we were raised knowing that this whenua was tapu, you know, mm. he whenua taurikura tenei. It's a very significant place to us because it's important to our identity and um, it's important to, you know, who we are. And um, that's having that knowledge um, and, you know, that knowledge encouraged us or, um, yeah, encouraged us to, mm. to lead this whawhai um, because it was so significant. It was tapu. Um, and so when, when something, with, especially within a Māori worldview, when something is significant to you and your people, um, you would do anything in your power um, mm-hmm. to, to protect um, that thing which is significant. And so, um, you know, I, I always say that, you know, we, we immediate, when we found out about that housing development, we immediately went into kaitiaki beast mode. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> you know, we, we tried everything that we could to prevent that development from going ahead. And, um, uh, and it was because of how significant this whenua is and, you know, encouraging people to come down here and um, having people who, you know, like yourself, who has been here already um, and felt that wairua, felt that, um, that peacefulness and that calmness and, uh, of this whenua um, could, you know, connect with it. Mm. And um, it was a no-brainer that people jumped on board this waka and, and supported um, the movement to protect uh, mm. this very important um, wahi tapu. Mm. Mm. Kia, ora. Yeah. Kia ora. I just want to go to a couple of parts I now from um, our, our viewers. 
Uh, Dallas asks, is there anything that Panya and her whanau would do differently now in hindsight? Would she measure, excuse me, would she measure success and what success looks like? Oh, <laughs> um, I would say it was, it's very difficult. Oh, no, actually, it, you know, six, what does success look like? Mm. Um, for us, it was mostly about protecting the whenua, but mm. the current legal system in Aotearoa uh, was discriminative, discriminative, sorry, I'm mixing my words, I'm hitting my oh, words good. today. I'm doing it too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there in the end. It's <laughs> yeah, discriminative to, um, you know, th these sorts of kaupapa and, mm. um, you know, Māori sites of significance. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but we knew that early on before we started. And, um, but, you know, wanting to, striving to be the best kaitaki we could be, um, we made that commitment to exhaust every legal means, even though we knew it was against us. So measuring success was obviously, you know, having one of those, um, you know, legal mechanisms work in favour of the protection of the whenua, Mm. Um, but unfortunately, none of them worked. The UN didn't work, even though they made a recommendation for um, the government to disestablish um, Special Housing Area 62 here at Ihumato. Um, you know, Heritage New Zealand, the agency tasked with protecting Wahi Tapu and sites of significance in Aotearoa, they were against us and weren't willing to protect this whenua because of the, um, you know, the the comp because of the confines of the legislation that they were operating in, um, you know, nothing worked. The only thing that worked for us was getting people to the whenua, having them take a stand mm. to save this land. And that is the only thing that got the government to put a stop to the development. Mm. So the only success that I was working towards over all these years, yep. because I knew the law was against us, mm. you know, my training at university told me that, um, mm. was getting people um, connected to the whenua mm -hmm. and having them uh, resonate with what we were doing here at Ihumato. Mm -hmm. And that was the only success that, that I was working towards, was getting the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, would I change anything over the years? Um, that's a hard one because, you know, it, it took – four and a half years for us to garner up that support that we received after the 23rd of July when we were evicted from our whenua. Um, you know, of course I want to change the legal system mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. it, it's that which has kept us in, in the struggle for all these years. Um, but, yeah, I, I, if there was one thing I could honestly... Um, say that I would cha have changed after all these years is probably having more courage, um, mm. having the the uh, you know the balls to stand up against some of the people that I had to stand up against, and that we as a as a campaign um had to stand up against, and um, have the balls to overcome some of the tikanga that we were restricted by. Mm. which has been a challenge for us in this kaupapa. And those would be two of the things that I would probably, uh, well, well, the one thing that I would probably have changed was having more balls, um, being more courageous, and um, being more brave to um, stand out um, mm. and go against the grain. Mm. Yeah. Yo, ho, you are amazing. You go against the grain. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Um, hearing that from you, like, oh, be more create, courageous. Wow. Okay, it's it's it seems like a lot to ask for um, from from somebody. Um, <laughs> you know, like, geez, be a superhero. I just pulled that out my. But um, yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of the the parts I that are coming up, you're answering as you talk. So I'm just trying to sift through and, and find that the ones that kind of are sticking out that you haven't um, touched on. Um, I've got one here from David is what can you share with emerging Indigenous students about the value of allyship 
in relation to biculturalism? It's a big one there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I think in this day and age, it's very important. And um, if we're going to honor Te Tiriti o Waitangi, the way that it was um, intended um, to operate, to work, and then we would work closely with our Pākehā or allies or our Tangata Tiriti mm. um, and vice versa. Um, and in line with our values, our Māori values around Manakitanga, Whanaunga Tanga mm. and Kotahi Tanga, it was important that we worked alongside our whānau. Um, when I when I meant said um, said whānau, I meant you know our Tangata Tiriti and, and our Pākehā allies. Um, you know, we recognised early on that they had the skills, um, they knew the language to fight the government or um, to present to councils and lawyers mm -hmm. and so on. And um, we were willing to operate that way so long as our Pākehā allies took our leadership um, or followed our leadership. And they were they were and are amazing. They followed our leadership right throughout. Um, so, yeah, it was important for us to work alongside of them. Um, and when I go back to the fundamentals of what Fenua stands for um, and what it means, again, I go back to it being inclusive. This wasn't a Māori issue for us. This mm -hmm. was a, a land issue. It was a New Zealand issue. It was a constitutional issue mm. because we were never heard in the um, in the establishment of the special housing area for Ihumato. We were disregarded for many, many generations. Um, you know, um, in regards to the issues that we faced, mm. and so um, tips would be to. Be clear and communicate to your uh, your your allies or our allies. You know what our tikanga is, mm. and for us it was that they had to um, take their leadership uh, and guidance from tangata whenua, from mana whenua, even if it meant that 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 leadership was coming from a younger group of people, mm. or even people that were less knowledgeable uh, than they were. Mm. Um, and I think that's um, what biculturalism should look like here in Aotearoa is that our Pākehā <laughs> allies, our Tangata mm. Tiriti are taking leadership from Māori and Tangata mm. Whenua um, and we can see why that benefits through you know, through many of the uh, um, indigenous rights movements around the world um, so yeah I, ho yeah, I hope mm. there was a tip in there yeah, kia ora. Um, we, we've got a couple of minutes to go, but I just want to check in with you if we're okay to go over time and take a few more pātai. Kia te pai. Man, I thought this was going to take ages, but this is like rolled around so fast. I'm like, what, well, sitting on the edge of my seat, like this is so cool. Um, <laughs> uh, from Ihaia uh, has a question in relation to, into the, relation to the previous one. Do you have any advice, like you said, for rangatahi? who hunger for change and who want to follow in the same path you've taken and what do you recommend their first steps to be? Um, have balls. <laughs> like I mentioned just before. Be <laughs> courageous and be brave. Um, for us as rangatahi yeah. and for rangatahi Māori, it's very difficult because mm. we are raised to, um, with the notion of tuakana taina. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that we have, we must respect our pakeke mm -hmm. and um, also this notion, taria te wā. You know, mm -hmm. there's a time and place for everything mm -hmm. and everyone. So a lot of the time I was told, you know, rangatahi, you sit down, you sit in right. your place, um, you know, your time will come. But for, for us and, and for me personally, um, you know, I, you know, I go back to that, one of the, ch that challenge that I mentioned earlier, um, the hardest thing in this kaupapa was hearing those stories from our pakeke mm -hmm. about how beautiful uh, Ihumata once was and how we, um, my generation, experienced less 
um, half of, of what our um, Pakeke experienced in their lifetime, and to think that my nieces and nephews will experience half of what I live, have lived through in my lifetime, you know, is, is, is shitty. Mm. Um, so for me, I was like, I can't wait another 20, 30 years for mm. you to, to vacate your seat, to retire, to pass on, um, that, um, you know, breaking one tikanga in order to um, get our point across about, you know, why our whenua needed to be protected or, um, you know, you know, whatever it was that, you know, we were trying to do was important for us. We couldn't wait. There, there's not enough time for us to have to wait to, to, for our, our time. Mm. So, yeah, it was about being courageous and being brave. But in saying that, you must carry with you um, humility. Mm. Um, you know, there's this korero, me whakaiti koe ya koe anō. Um, you must be humble in the way that you present your take. Um, you know, so when we did, we always acknowledged the role that our pakeke um, played, um, their whawhai and their role, um, and then come to say, um, but we are the ones who are going to have to live uh, with the consequences of say special housing area 62 here for Ihumato and that we couldn't wait for our time so with us we um that notion of tuakana teina for us it had to be reciprocal so whilst we respect and honor and take leadership from our pakeke um it should be reciprocal and that our um, we should be walking alongside and working with our pakeke as as well um also um to, to rangatahi um you know, if, seek every opportunity available to you. Um, don't be closed off. Be open-minded. Um, and never shut off the people who may come in and out of your life. Um, you know, you, you might hate somebody and they might, you know, challenge your thoughts. You know, I have this guy that always loves to pay the devil's advocate mm. on anything that I, um, you know, am you know, I'm thinking or, or what, what I talk about. Mm. Um, but that, I know that guy will stand on the front line with me. He will lay across um, the road um, in front of the bulldozer should it come down uh, down to it. And so, um, yeah, just have an open mind and being courageous again. Mm, cool. And you must have those real connections with people that are surrounding you to know that they've done that for you and the campaign literally physically put themselves in that position um we do i'll take maybe two two more is that all right yeah um so these are a uh, part from elliot what are pania's thoughts on the present chance for an outcome uh, there were expectations of an announcement at waitangi day yes um I feel like I'm, like I mentioned before, I feel like I'm always saying that the resolution is just around the corner yeah. or that an announcement is going to be made um, and then something always comes up. Mm. And so um, we, we left the conversations um, back um, before uh, Waitangi um, Day. And so um, what we, you know, the Kingitanga came here and the, the king um, picked up his flag um, because we were satisfied where the discussions um, had re had reached. Uh, so, th you know, I don't want to say it again, <laughs> but, you know, we can expect a, a, an announcement soon. Um, we just don't know when because something tends to always pop up yep. when or just before the announcement is supposed to be made. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I can't say when, um, but we're hoping soon and we're being patient, um, especially during this time with the, the issues that we face as a nation. Um, and so, yeah, if, we've, if we can wait 163 years mm. uh, for justice, um, then we can just wait a little bit longer. And we're lucky because we're here on our whenua and we're living as though the resolution has already been met. 
Mm. Fletchers have left with all of their equipment. There's no police and security presence here anymore. It's just us and the whanau living here on the whenua um, and living our best lives, growing our kai, living out the hopes and aspirations for our people, um, which was to return the whenua to what it was once used for, um, to share it with Aotearoa and to honour it um, for its historical, cultural, spiritual um, significance. Mm. And so, yeah. Kia ora. Um, and lastly, what are your hopes and dreams for Ihu Matau? Um, my hopes and dreams for Ihu Matau, first and foremost, is to allow a space for our whanau to dream up or to come up with a vision that they have for this whenua. It's mm. been in, um, you know, the Wallace ownership for 156 years. Um, we've, you know, been restricted from, from using it, from connecting with it, and from, you know, protecting it for so many years. And so I hope that our whanau will get the opportunity to, um, you know, come up with with their hopes and aspirations for the whenua. And then secondly, my hopes and aspirations for this whenua is to return it to what it was once used for, to grow kai on this whenua, uh, to have people come and connect with it and experience all the benefits that whenua um, has for us as individuals, spiritually, physically, um, mentally. Um, I hope to grow a food forest here once day, one, mm. one day and have people come here and harvest kai from it. And I hope that people can come here and plant a seed and in years to come have their tamariki and mokopuna harvest kai from that seed and learn about how their whanau took a stand to save this land. Um, and I hope that we can honour the stories that the whenua holds, um, share the stories of hape, and mataofo, and kaifare, um, and ōtua taua, um, with, with, you know, everyone. And I hope we can share this whenua with all of Aotearoa. And so that's what my um, aspirations and hopes for this whenua are. Oh, kia ora el hoa. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate all the pātai that has come through. I know we could sit with you for another hour and just kind of delve deep into the <laughs> scope of it. I um, really, really enjoyed it. A pānia tēnā koe i te amorangi, a mau i te whakamaiti kōrau, e kia e ki taumata ai, tātou kura, e kore e ai, i te kupu, ki a koe i te manoa titi, a nō reira, a kamehi, uh, thank you to our partners, particularly Community Research, for the webinar support and volunteers. And our team today, Miriam and Becky in the background. Kia ora kōrua. And this is our slide with our partner logos. I just want to do a quick plug-in and special mention for Ngā Mana, our Tanga Te Whenua Allied Health. Um, I'm the, the co-chair, so I just thought I'd get my little plug in here. Um, it's free to join, and um, if you just go to ngapomana.org.nz, and it's um, really about gaining um, aspirations for our Māori health work workforce at this time. Um, so we'd really like to get um, our voice as a Māori health workforce out there to the government, um, considering the COVID-19 kaupapa. Um, and this... This recording will be made available via YouTube and the website. And we also have a Facebook group, bit.ly slash decol2020. And just remembering those uh, three messages, e noho ki te kainga, kia hau maru te noho, uh, mā reira tātou e ora ai. Uh, karakia whakamutinga, uh, hikitia, Ikitia te rongo mai fiti o tēnei kaupapa, tukua ke ia, tukua ke oi, korangi nui, ki runga, ko papa tuanuku ki raro, ki te whaiao, ki te ao mārama, tuturu whakamaua ki ao tīna. Haumie, ye, taiki e. Taiki e. Kia ora pānia.
Maioria ora tata e katoa. Kia ora.